Uh, thank you guys for coming out. Um, you know, recapping the LSU game uh, again. I, I think even two days later, still a thank you to the 12th man. It seems worth it. Um, it really was. It was a great night in Kyle Field and uh, an unbelievable atmosphere. Um, I think our players of the game, uh, O line, we gave it to Trey Zune and Demetrius Crownover. Uh, I thought that was Demetrius Crownover's best game uh, of the week for sure. Defensive line-wise, we gave it to Shamar Turner and DJ Hicks. Uh, really proud of DJ. I think he's really starting to come into his own. Probably the last three weeks, I think you've seen a real upward trajectory from him and starting to really play the way he's capable of, an extremely productive player for us. So it's been great to see his development. Offensively, uh, we gave it to Marcel Reed, obviously the big spark that he provided coming in off the bench with three touchdowns. He was also named SEC Freshman of the Week, and so excited for him. Uh, also gave some, a shout-out, though, to Amari Daniels. I thought that was his best game of the year, uh, the way he ran the ball and the way he carried himself, and thought that was great. Um, Defensively, we gave it to B.J. Mays. The two interceptions obviously shifted the game completely. Uh, talked about that after the game. And then you know, the one guy that I didn't talk about after the game who, who certainly needs some mentioning is Tyler White again. Uh, he was our special teams player of the game. He was also the SEC special teams player of the week again for the third time. Uh, he had five punts last week. Three of them netted over 50 yards. One of them was pinned on the seven-yard line. And so he just continues to be a weapon for us. And so um, you know, when you look at the game, I, I think it, you know, it comes down to the critical factors. I think we won the critical factors. We won the turnover margin three to one. You know that's always going to be a really good indicator. Uh, we won on special teams. We were plus seven on our special teams game changers chart. Uh, a lot of that was how we did punting the football. So at the times when we weren't, you know, playing the way we necessarily wanted to, we were able to control field position and flip the field with with some great net punts. Um, you know, we won the fourth quarter, 17 to six, and when you do that. That's going to win you a lot of football games. And then, you know, I just think the the line of scrimmage running game in this league still matters, you know. And when you can outrush a team by close to 200 yards, um, you know, it's going to lead to a successful night. And so, um, you know, we're excited with where we're at. And, and now we kind of turn our attention ahead to, to an extremely big challenge. I think this will be um, the biggest challenge of the year to date. Uh, this is going to be an extremely talented team, four and three, coming off of a bye week. Um, certainly could be six and seven and one easily, um, or six and one, excuse me, easily. Um, I just think they're a team that is has has grown every week. They're playing a lot of really talented young guys mixed in with a, a blend of a talented veterans, and um, you know this is going to be an enormous challenge for our program. And so. Um, it's back to work. It's it's do the things we got to do this week to prepare to give ourselves the best chance to kind of move forward and and kind of go where we want to go as a program. Um, and then just the the last thing, and, and it's just comical that I actually have to do this, but but it's necessary. Um, you know, in the post game, I was asked to kind of give a synopsis on how we sell culture to our program. Um, in doing so, I made a statement. Uh, that seemed like a very benign statement that somehow managed to be taken as a shot directly at people. Uh, you guys gave me multiple opportunities in nine months to take shots at people, and I've never done it. I have nothing but respect for Coach Fisher. I've said nothing but positive things about Coach Fisher. I'm the head coach at Texas A&M because of Coach Fisher. I appreciate who he is, everything that he's done. And for anybody in the media to think that that was what I was doing post-LSU is is I mean, it's asinine. And for it to be about any other head coach who gave me an opportunity and hired me, um, and that's not who I am. I've never been that person. Um, and it's, it's, it's ridiculous, but it is what it is. So I wanted to make sure that everybody knows I wasn't talking to anybody directly. So from there, I'll open it up to questions. Down front, Brent, and then Nolan. I just figured you were talking about Sam Pittman. Sure. Um, have you handled it? <laughs> yeah, that's a joke. I'll I got to say that part. Um, <laughs> How are you going to handle the quarterback situation moving forward? Have you made a decision on that? Or no. Could you possibly play two? Yeah, I, I think the possibility is there for a lot of things. Uh, I think we're going to look at um, this week, kind of figure out what we think the right thing is for us, uh, what we think gives us the best chance to win moving forward. Um, it's probably too early in our mind to, to kind of make that decision. Um, and even if we did, we probably wouldn't tell you right now anyway. But um, but no, I, I think we just want to see how this week plays out, kind of see what we think gives us the best shot to go into this environment and be successful, um, and then kind of go forward from there. Second row on the right, Olin. Mike, how have you felt about your guys uh, throughout the season, the ability to have a big game win or lose and to refocus 
immediately. Yeah, you know, I, I think I like what I hear from them when they talk to you. I think that means the messaging is getting through. I think we've we've tried to attack this thing from a mindset of, um, you know, we need to improve every week. We need to get better every week. We need to approach every challenge and, and give ourselves the opportunity to earn success every week. And, um, you know, you say those things a lot, and then sometimes they get up and you hear them talk and you don't hear those those words come from them, right? And I think every time, um, you know, I saw Albert today, uh, you hear even guys like Marcel and BJ after the game, um, you know, BJ, or uh, Marcel on national TV after the game talking about the next opportunity. And so, um, yeah, I think they're locked in and focused on what we're capable of. And I think what we're capable of is is got to be the next step, growth, development, because I think, um, you know, if we finished five and three in the SEC, I don't think anyone in our locker room would be real happy with that. Front left, Cease. Any update on Basantis first at all? Yeah, no. I mean, he was out last week. Um, he's probably going to be out for, for a couple weeks until we get him back. And so, um, you know, we'll kind of see where that one progresses coming out of the bye week. Penalties really haven't cost you as far as the game's concerned yet, but how do you mix having aggressive, aggressive what your team yeah. is, but making some bad penalties? And then I didn't realize until after something pregame went on, so could you address those those things? Yeah, I, I got nothing on the pregame thing. Obviously, that's something we'll handle internally and, and make sure that doesn't become an issue. Um, you know, the penalties are a concern. Um, you know, we addressed it again this morning. We, we continue to address it. We address it every day, but... Um, you know, until you get it fixed and corrected, you're not doing it the right way. And so as a staff, I think we got to look at ourselves and figure out ways, um, you know, and the two areas that are the two areas that are most concerning and most frustrating to me are pre-snap and post-snap. You know, you, you're going to play football in the SEC and there's going to be a holding penalty. There's going to be a defensive PI. Like those things are going to happen. You don't want a lot of them, but they're not going to completely ever go away. Our pre-snap procedural penalties on offense and our post-snap penalties are going to kill us. And so, um, again, we've got to do a better job as a staff making sure that our players understand that. We certainly try, but but we're not getting it done, and so we got to get it done. Third row on right, David, and then Alex. Mike, can you talk a little bit about the art of dominating the line of scrimmage and a few of your wins? It's like the second half or it's the fourth quarter where we really see the separation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think, one, it, it'd be hard-pressed to not give a shout-out to Tommy Moffitt in that regard and, and what our kids did with him. Um, it's certainly a mindset in terms of how we practice and um, talking a lot about stressing and uh, straining and, and effort throughout the course of practice. We make a huge emphasis on the last team period of practice every time we go out there. Um, you know, And then I think it's just a credit to our kids that I think when you look at us, we're playing the game in a way that – um, we're playing very level. You know, it's not, you know, we're not a, an emotional roller coaster. We're not, you know, starting like a fire plug and then all of a sudden we kind of fade away. Like we're coming in prepared for a three and a half hour fight. Um, and I think that maybe has shown itself a little bit in the fourth quarter. There hasn't been panic. There's just been a stick to to just stay with what we're doing and maybe find a way to elevate it and do it a little bit better. And a little bit more on the uh, South Carolina team. Defensively, I look at all their stats. They're in the top three or four in everything defensively. Yeah, yeah they're, they're extremely talented. Uh, you know, their front is phenomenal. Um, the two kids on the edge, they got um, – you know, the transfer from Georgia Tech and then the freshman playing for them on the edge. Both those kids are going to be first round draft picks, if not top 10, five picks in the draft. Um, they've got an interior kid who's extremely dominant, plays very physical. They're athletic at the second level. Um, they got a first round safety who's. 6'3", 225 pounds back there. And uh, I apologize right now, it's a lot of numbers in my head, not a lot of names. But um, you know, watching them, um, you know, they allow their, their defensive line to impact the game. And, and when you look at them, what they've done is successfully turn people over uh, and create opportunities for their offense. And so in the games that they've been really successful, the defense has, has taken the game over in so many ways. And so, um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's by far the best group that we've played to date. And, um, you know, playing them coming off of a bye week where they got extra preparation and they're going to be really dialed in on what they want to do against us, um, it's going to be a huge challenge. Second row on the left, Alex. Yeah, I guess just first, how much of what Marcel did in the three games he started and won elevated your confidence in him to go out and execute when y'all actually turned to him on Saturday? Yeah, I would say a lot. You know, I, th I think there was there was questions asked in the opener, um, you know, and I don't know that, um, 
we it ever crossed our mind in the opener, right? And and um, you know for a variety of reasons, but but probably just because you know that's not the right place to put a young kid in Marcel. And so um, you know when you when you see him go out and play the way he does, um, you know we talked after the Missouri game. He made it an extremely challenging decision. It was not an easy decision where to go with this thing. We think we have two very quality quarterbacks. Um, so you know what Marcel can do. And, and it just, again, it was not on Connor completely. It wasn't, you know, there were a lot of faults on our offensive, you know, failures on, on Saturday night um, from coaching to play calling to me, to Colin, to our O-line, to our wide, you know, it was everywhere. And, and certainly Connor played a piece of it. Um, but, you know, you know, you have this guy who, who is an extremely quality, capable kid and is a, a different dynamic and so, you know, when the opportunity presents itself to make a change and try to inject some life into it, you're certainly comfortable that he can do it. And what, what do you need to see from this offense to, to elevate itself as you guys try and chase a championship here this final month of the season? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're still just looking for some consistency in the throw game. And, and it's just, it feels like we're still working through a lot of the timing elements of it. Um, you know, and that, that sounds like coach speak, but it's it's the reality. You know, we're not in a really good timing rhythm of you know, the quarterback going through his progressions in the right timing, the wideouts being in the right windows in the right timing, and then when all of those things are happening, then sometimes the old line's failing, and that happened more Saturday night than it has in previous weeks. But you know, then all of a sudden, okay, we get, we've got it, and the quarterback's about to throw it, and then you know we get sacked, um, and so I just think. We have to get our passing game working in a rhythm that it can be more productive and more efficient for us uh, if we want it to go down the road the way we want to. Right side on back, Chip. Mike, what, what goes into the decision that you made in the third quarter on, on Saturday? Had you already discussed that at halftime with, with staff? Is that totally your decision? How does that come about when, when you decide to make that switch? Yeah, I mean, ultimately it's my decision. I think, um, you know, Colin and I kind of go into every week and, and you know, he, he comes up with the plans. But I think, you know, we have to have a plan for Marcel ready at all times because you never know injury-wise how the game's going to play. And so, like, we, ha we go into the game and Connor's our starter and we develop a game plan around Connor and the best way we think Connor can attack uh, LSU, but then you also have to have in the back of your mind, okay, well, what happens if Connor goes down and, and Marcel's got to go out there and win us this game? Like, what does that look like? Um, and so I think it's a credit to Colin that he's able to do that in a way that doesn't create a lot of volume for our offensive players. Uh, it's real subtle tweaks and differences that, that you can change that don't change a lot for a lot of people. So it's not like we're practicing two completely different offenses. We just have enough wrinkles within our system that we can tailor it to who the quarterback is. Um, you know, and so you have that plan ready and you know it's there. So then when the offense isn't isn't firing or isn't isn't being efficient enough and you feel like you have an opportunity to, to try to inject some life into the game, um, that's kind of what you do. As a defensive coach, how hard would you say it is to prepare for both of those guys? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a challenge because, you know, I, I think their strengths uh, are kind of contrasting. You know, I, I think Connor's strength is his ability to see things, his quick release, his ability to function and operate in the RPO game. And so um, based on how you rotate, based on where you create access, if you are trying to outnumber the box, uh, Connor has the ability to beat you with his arm, and then he's certainly athletic enough that he can do some things with his feet and, and be a weapon in that regard as well. Some um, Marcel is kind of the exact opposite, right? He can do enough in the RPO game. He can throw the ball enough in the RPO game, and then certainly has the arm talent to throw the drop back in the play action game. But he has a different dynamic in terms of his ability to, to run the zone read game and the different types of read plays that you can run. And so um, when, you, when you're doing all of that, you're really touching the entire gauntlet of offense, right? You're, you're kind of attacking it from every different angle. And so um, as a defensive coach, I'd imagine that that'd be challenging to try to get your kids ready for all of that. Coach, we'll stay on the right side. Ben? Uh, just kind of finishing up on the, the two quarterbacks, uh, do you feel like it's it's practical or pragmatic because those guys have their different strengths to, I guess, go into a situation where you kind of think more game plan, like this type of game plan would work out better against this opponent and be able to potentially go back and forth? Or do you think it's more pragmatic to just 
kind of figure out internally what you think is best and go with that? Yeah, I, I think we'll kind of come to those decisions. I, I think, um, you know, I, I think we've got to try to figure out what's best for this offense, what's best for those two young kids, um, what's best for this program for the rest of this season. And so um, I think that that'll take some conversation this week as we go through the week and, and try to figure out the best way to go. And then how do, how do you, uh, especially with the guys who've been on this team for, you know, a year, a couple of years, who have been in a lot of those games where it feels like they've just about to turn the corner and they've come up short in a lot of close games, uh, you know, and then, you know, get off to a slow start against LSU. For those guys, how do you kind of message as a staff just kind of fighting against that initial, the basic human instinct of almost like I've seen this movie before, but that it is going to be a different outcome? Yeah, I think a lot of a lot of that comes back to what they did throughout the off season. I think we've we've gotten into a lot of these games, into a lot of these moments, into a lot of these high stress situations down the stretch, and, and spent a lot of time focusing on the things that they've done, the work they put in, the different things they've done with Coach Moffitt, um, what they've done to prepare themselves for those moments. Um, and we ask them to think about all the things that they've invested and put into this and then trust it and rely on it. Uh, and I think to this point, they've done a good job with that. To the left, Rob. Howdy, Coach. Howdy. Uh, so I think our fan base has really embraced you because you bring a blue-collar, hard-working type style. And, and, and uh, seven wins. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's not forget that. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> I'm not and that you speak the truth from the microphone. I'm not naive. <laughs> the other night after um, the team had sawed him off, um, I caught a moment as I was shooting that you walked over to the in front of the student section and you, you kind of did a embrace, kind of a thank you and a, and a gig -um to our student section. Tell me what you were thinking during that moment and, and what the 12th man has, has meant to you guys. Yeah, I, I just think standing there, sawing them off, that was such an impressive scene. Uh, and the energy that that student section brought that whole game, um, just kind of the whole way through, I was just it was just in my mind. And, um, yeah, I didn't know the right way to thank them, and, and that was the best thing that I could think of. Uh, I think it was certainly still on my mind when I came to the podium. It's still on my mind when I came to the podium today. I just think for everything that they do for our program, I want them to understand how much we appreciate it. And we appreciate their support, and we appreciate how they're there for us through thick and thin, no matter what. And, and for me, this is year five, really, with that support. Um, four is the DC, one is the head coach, obviously. And, and the first time I'm really at ground level, with the opportunity to, to, to show my appreciation. And so I think that's kind of where some of that stuff has come from. Back behind the lights in the middle, Tyler, and then to the left, Luke. Mike, Al Albert Reed just said this is probably the best defensive line he's played on. Uh, what have you seen from him specifically in, in, in his game? And, and do you feel like the line uh, continues to improve throughout the season? Yeah, I'll, I'll flip it and I'll tell you that he's a main reason why it's the best defensive line he's played on. I, I think he is one of the most unsung heroes on this team in terms of the level that he's playing at. Um, he's immovable in there right now. Uh, he's extremely physical. He's making a lot of plays in the interior run game. Uh, I think he... Uh, and to some degree, Shamar Turner too. But I think Albert, just because of his, his his being at the nose guard and being in the center of it, are really altering people's game plans because they're having such a hard time running the ball between the tackles. Um, you know, and then when you talk about the depth, you know, the ability to bring in DJ Hicks, the bring, the the. Uh, ability to bring in Cassius Howell, the ability for Rylan Kenny to show up all of a sudden in the fourth quarter fresh and go get a sack. Um, just what we're able to do rotating people around. Um, you know, Rodis Johnson comes in and gets a pressure that leads to the first turnover interception, right? And so, um, yeah, I just there's a lot of quality in that group, which allows us to rotate, which I think allows them to, to stay fresh and, and continue to get stronger as the season goes on. To the left, Luke, and then Carter, you'll wrap us up. Coach, when you look at your third down success recently uh, in, in the season in general, is there anything you can do in practice to kind of prepare for that, or is there anything that really goes into preparing for moments like those? 
Tell me, uh, are you talking our lack of success or uh, success? Uh, the success. Y'all doing well on third down on offense. On off. Oh, you're yes, talking sir. about on offense. Yep. Okay. My, 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 my mind went to defense, and I'm like, we <laughs> were bad the other night. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think one of the things we do probably a little different is we get the third down early in the week. And so we start installing our third down game plan on Tuesday. Um, that's different. A lot of teams don't do that. Um, I think for us or, or me, as, me as a coach, I understand – and have always wanted to kind of give our kids the best chance to get their head wrapped around the different blitz packages, the different looks you're going to get on third down. Um, it's different, right? And, and you get to a point in the season where, you know, okay, we've blocked inside zone enough. You know, one less rep of blocking inside zone on first down and one more rep at some exotic third down pressure maybe helps us. And so um, that's been a big part of it, I think. Um, you know, it's an emphasis point, obviously, across the board, but it is for most programs. But, but I think we do a good job of getting our kids to understand it. Um, and then I think we've done a good job of trying to manage the down and distances we get into, uh, and that always helps as well. And Carter, right side, wrap us up. We've got Trey Zoon ready. Uh, Mike, you, you mentioned, you've mentioned that uh, it wasn't all on Connor um, against LSU. Just maybe what could he do better when things aren't going right, whether it's pass protection or receivers not making plays? What can he do in those moments maybe a little bit better so he can kind of weather that storm? Yeah, I, I think, and, and I think he would tell you this, I, I think he gets sped up sometimes. Um, and so, um, you know, his clock starts moving faster when he's not having success. And uh, his eyes are going through the progressions a little too quick. He's, he's getting the ball out of his hand a little bit too quick. I think we saw that on a couple of the throws. And, um, or he, he rushes his mechanics a little bit and the ball sails on him. And so I just think... Um, you know, he's still got it. He still has a ton of growth. He's still got a ton of repetition that he needs and experience that he needs to get, gather um, to just be able to consistently go through the progressions at the pace and speed that you need to. Um, so that, again, everything in the passing game is about your eyes and feet being on time with the wideouts. And, and if the wideouts aren't there, then that, that's a problem. If your eyes and feet aren't there, that's a problem, and, and I think sometimes our wideouts are a little too slow getting where they need to be, and I think sometimes Connor's a little too fast um, as he goes through his progressions. Thanks for your time, Coach. Yeah, appreciate you guys.